Good morning, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> We're going to go ahead and begin our, our morning session this morning. We have uh, one of our ministerial students uh, who will be giving a word this morning, and that in the person of Brother Genesis Henry. So we're looking forward to hearing from him. Uh, but at this time, we're going to ask uh, Brother Roy Montgomery to lead us in a word of prayer as we start out. Let us pray. Dear Father, we want to thank you for this day. We want to thank you for everything that you've done for us, to God. We want to thank you for the blessings that we know of and that we do not know of, to God. We want to thank you for the armor of protection that you've given us um, as we slept, to God, and as we came here today. We want to ask that you uh, bless us today, the Lord, that everything that, that is done is pleasing and acceptable in your sight. This is your son, King Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. And we'll join in with us as we lift our hearts and voices in song. I'm so glad that Jesus lifted me. I'm so glad that Jesus lifted me. I'm so glad that Jesus lifted me. Give it up glory, hallelujah. Jesus lifted me. I'm glad, say I'm so glad, so glad Jesus lifted me. Oh, I know that I'm so glad that Jesus lifted me. Oh, I'm so glad, glad that Jesus lifted me. Well, we're singing in glory, hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Satan had me bound, I know that Satan had me bound, but Jesus lifted me. Oh, I know that Satan had me bound, but Jesus lifted me. Oh, Satan had me bound, but Jesus lifted me. Well, we're singing in glory, hallelujah, oh Jesus. And I'm so glad, I know that I'm so glad, I'm glad that Jesus, oh, oh, oh I'm so glad, I'm glad that Jesus lifted me, oh, 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 I'm so glad, glad that Jesus lifted me, well, we're singing in glory, hallelujah, oh, I know that Jesus, one more time, I'm glad. And I'm so, I'm so glad that Jesus lifted me. I'm glad, I'm glad, so glad that Jesus. Oh, I'm glad, I'm glad that Jesus lifted me. Well, we're singing in glory, hallelujah. Jesus lifted me. Amen. We'll have one more song after which we will hear from none other, none other than Brother Genesis Henry. Let the Spirit of the Lord, let it rise among us. Let the Spirit of the Lord, let it rise among us. And let the praises of our King, let it rise among us. Let it rise, we say, oh. Spirit of the Lord, say, Let the Spirit of the Lord let it rise among us. Let the Spirit of the Lord let it rise among us. And let the praises of our King let it rise among us. Let it rise. And we say, Oh, 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 oh let it rise. song. Hey, we want to let it rise. Yes, and let the song. Oh, we want to let it rise. And the praises to our King. Yeah, we want to let it rise among us. Let it rise. And we say, oh, 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 oh let it rise. Let the 
glory, oh let it rise, and the praises to our King, let it rise, oh we want to let it rise, let it rise, and we say oh, 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 oh let it rise, somebody let the Spirit of the Lord say let the Spirit Spirit, oh, let it rise, and the praises to our King, yeah, let it rise, oh, we want to let it rise, let it rise, and we say, oh, 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 say, oh, 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 Bow your heads with me, please. Dear Father in heaven, we come to you first and foremost, thanking you for another day, another second to have our heart beat in our chest, Father, to let the blood flow through our body, yeah. to let the air in our lungs. Yeah. Father, we come asking you to calm the waves in our hearts, in our spirits, in our troubled bodies, Father. Hmm. Open our hearts as we, as we sit with you today, Lord. Where you said there are two or more gathered in your name, there you are, Father, so we know that you're in this place today. And in Jesus' name we pray, we say amen. amen. Today we'll be reading from Mark chapter 5. That is, again, Mark chapter 5, verses 21, and it will go all the way down, I believe, to 34. Most of you know this, so I'll give you guys time to get to it. That's Mark 5, starting at verse 21. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. I find it to be the easiest version to study in. When you have it, say amen. And it reads, And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd about, gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus, by the name. And seeing him, he fell at his feet. And implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter at this is at the point of death. Come lay your hands on her so that she may be made so, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. A great crowd followed him and thronged him about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for twelve years, and who had suffered much under many physicians. And had spent all she had had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I even touch his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Other versions say she explained herself. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. That's where we're going to finish at. Right. Going back up to, where are we going to go? Verse 22. It says, then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by, the na by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, my little daughter, at this point of death, come lay your, my little daughter is at the point of death, come lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. He went with him, and a great crowd followed him. And then once the great crowd followed him, the woman with the, of discharge pushed through the crowd. And it, it gives her background. 
that she went to many physicians, doctors, trying to get healed, trying to figure out what was wrong with her. But nobody can heal her. In fact, they made her worse. After she had been made worse and she heard about a man named Jesus, she went to go find Jesus. She switched her crowd, got out in the open, pushed through a bunch of people in the Greek. Um, I, can't, I can't remember the exact word, but the Greek definition, when you read King James, when the word is translated, it means to press hard, the word thronged. It's two words separated in the Greek. By English definition, it means to press hard. That means if you have one person in the center and you have a bunch of people around them and they're pushing so tightly, it's almost impossible to breathe. This will make sense to you just in a second. She had snuck up behind Jesus, uh, I believe Luke puts it, and touched the hem, other versions that say, of his garment. This is where it's already shouting points were missed. I'm not a yeller. I didn't, I don't, I just haven't been that person since I started. But I'll, I'll point it out to you just like this. The question is how did she get to Jesus through a crowd? But first you have to figure out who the crowd was following. And then you gotta figure out where Jesus was going. He was first dealing with the first situation, somebody else's problem, a 12 year old little girl who was dying. Yeah. As he's going to go heal her, she gets blessed because of somebody else's issues. Wow. Look at it like this. Sometimes we have to go through things so that others can be blessed. It, it, it may not make sense to most of us. Why do we have to suffer so someone else can be blessed? All of it lives within itself a learning lesson. What's the learning lesson? Suffer first, reward later. This woman, also another shouting point missed, doesn't have a name. She is then labeled as the woman with the issue of blood. But she's been bleeding for 12 years. Also, again, she doesn't have an age. The Bible doesn't leak that information. Where am I going with this? I'll explain. So if for 12 years she's been bleeding, typically uh, the other, other versions in the Bible says it's a hemorrhage. A hemorrhage is internal bleeding. Um, Bible scholars would say that her bleeding came from in the womb, so we'll say ministration discharge, right? If a female starts her ministration typically at 13, because she doesn't disclose her age, we're going to play on her age factor. From 13, 12 years later, now she's 25, and she's been having the same bleeding problem. Leviticus 15, if we go to the book of Leviticus, if you read Leviticus 15, verses 25, this will make sense to most. I'm not a shouter once again. But it's amazing how this all plays out once you start seeing it. Got to read it to you. Leviticus 15, verse 25 says, If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of the discharge, she shall continue in uncleanliness. As, the days, as in the days of her impurity, she shall be unclean. Every bed on which she lies, all the days of her discharge, she, she uh, shall be to her as the bed of her impurity, and everything on which she sits shall be unclean, as in the uncleanness of her menstrual imp impurity. And whoever touch touches these things shall be unclean, and shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the evening. Now, one thing's first. If, not if, the law states that she's unclean. She's ceremonially unclean. She cannot touch anything, otherwise everything she touches will be unclean. She cannot be around people, otherwise they will be unclean. But she just walked through a crowd of people that were pressing so tightly, the only way you can get through was to touch them. Oh, y'all missed it. Oh, y'all missed it. Hold on, let, let's, let's, let's play on the age factor again. If she started a menstrual cycle and been having a problem for 12 years at 13, let's play on that. Just for now, I'm gonna play on two different ages. That means from the age of 13 to 25, she could have never, if she had brothers, sisters, mother, father, she had to be an outcast in her family. Couldn't eat with them, couldn't hug them, couldn't touch them, couldn't cry with them, couldn't commune with them. Absolute loneliness, physically. 
getting through the age of maturity, she has to find a husband. But she can't get a husband because she can't touch anything or anyone. Now I'm going through adulthood, lonely. Now, if she's not, didn't start at the age of 13, and started later in life and she's around the age of 30, then she still has to go most of her life lonely. She's bleeding internally. Inside, she's a mess. Inside, she's hurting. But on the outside, she looks just fine. Nobody knows but her and the people who labeled her as unclean. Imagine having to go 12 years of your life and everybody around you is telling you that you are unclean. Whenever you walk, touch, eat, drink, everybody's looking at you and staring at you like you're a bad person because of something that you have no control over. Everyone in this room is bleeding internally. And what stops the bleeding? Who stops the bleeding? Let's, let's not even focus on that. What has been causing you to bleed? Think about that. What, what, because y'all still in here as well. What has been causing you to bleed? Stop looking at the bleeding as the physical representation of blood coming out the body. Look at the bleeding as life, problems, emotions, addictions, things that cause you to sin. She was made ceremonially unclean, just how we are made ceremonially unclean by sin. What's causing you to bleed internally? Just as her, we are labeled by our sins. How would you like and how would you feel that every time you walked around, they said fornicator, adulterer. They walked around and they said drunkard. They walked around and they said, oh, he, he, he's, he does a lot of cussing. He's he, bad mouth. And they never call you by your name. And that everywhere you go, people are yelling at you everything that you do wrong because you're bleeding internally and you have no control over it. What happens? Think about the people who are not like us, who didn't have the option or who has the option but never got taught the good news like we did and who are bleeding internally. This woman, it goes on to say that she had spent all her life earnings on doctors and physicians, and none of them can make it better. In fact, it made it worse. Look at the physicians as us going to worldly things to fix something internal. Internal. It gets you nothing. It gets you nowhere. Instead, you spend your whole life digging in your pockets to get a quick fix. Maybe it's the quick fix of getting high just to feel good about yourself, to numb the pain for a second. Or maybe it's to go down to the corner store and get you a drink. Or maybe we're all of age in here. Maybe it's sexual desires and you don't have control over that so you run to the quickest thing to fix that urge. She spent everything she had on the world to get a fix and they're gonna keep taking from her until she had nothing left. And then when she had nothing left, what did they say? She's uncurable. The world takes and takes and takes and takes and takes and takes until she has nothing left. So now she's now not only been bleeding for 12 years internally, not only has she been, been an outcast for 12 years, not only has she been ridiculed and talked about for 12 years, not only has she been drained of energy in her life for 12 years. But she still somehow has a faith that some of us can't even attain. How can, how can she, of hearing of a man named Jesus, just of hearing of him, decide to throw away all the laws and break every rule to leave her home or the spot that she was dedicated at to be unclean to walk through a crowd of, crowd of people, making them all unclean, and still having faith to know that this man that just popped up on the scene, that from age 12 started preaching in the synagogues and died at 33, that this man who's never been known for anything up until the point of preaching will do what everybody is gossiping 
to her about? Where is our faith? We have faith, and we, we say, oh, God, uh, can you do this for me, and can you do that for me? And, 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 and then as soon as we don't get that, as soon as life falls apart, all of us was there at one point in time. We lose faith. In the book of Timothy, it, it explains how that believers will fall from being believers to unbelievers. But look at her faith. She says, if I just touch the hem, if I just barely grab the bottom, if I can just get close enough to swipe a finger, I know that everything internally will stop and I will be healed. But how? How is the question? How, can, how do you have such a face? If I could sit down and talk to her today, I would ask her how. Did she come up in her mind subconsciously that quick to believe in something she's never even seen before? But a lot of the youth and even older people and even atheists that I know still can't understand that God is real without seeing him, but a woman who never got to see Jesus until she actually experienced him could believe. X out, X out the faith portion. Let's, 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 let's put it like this. When she touched the hem of his garment, she was healed. Then Jesus asked, who touched me? Ah. Oh. Y'all missed it again. Oh, y'all missed it again. She touched him, and it says, immediately, instantly, in that mere moment, she was healed. <clears throat> she went to the true physician and immediately got healed. And he didn't even know who touched him. Luke would point out and says that Peter talked back to Jesus and said, there's a bunch of people around you. Mark doesn't include who said it. Matthew, I believe, says Peter, but I did a lot of study, but I just got off work, so my brain ain't that. But it's even like this. If you go to the book of Luke, it cancels out. The, it doesn't put the part of physicians in there. Why? Because Luke was a physician. Why would he point out physicians as being bad? Because it's part of his field of his business. So in coming to the scripture, I had to figure out which book was the best, which book was going to make it plain, which book was going to give you what you needed. Now. Mark writes it out in detail. This woman, 12 years of bleeding, didn't have nobody to help her. If, if anything, they took from her, ridiculed, lonely, all alone. Jesus instantly heals us. Jesus instantly heals us. I didn't say her, I said us. Before you even get to knowing that he did, before you even get to declaring that he did, he already did it. The faith action of going to the master and saying, you know what, nothing I've tried, no one I've tried, nowhere I've gone, no man I saw, no woman I've experienced, no relationship I've dip, dipped and dabbled in has fixed me. I'm still bleeding internally, Lord, how can I get the fix? But he says, come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. He says, all it takes is faith as small as a mustard seed, and you tell this mountain to move, and it'll move. He says, peace be still to the waves, and they obey. Peter falls into water, and he picks him up. This woman, who didn't follow Jesus all of, her, all of his life, this woman, who only heard of him, goes up to him, touches to him, immediately is healed by faith. Faith, by faith. We believe that everything that we're going to do, by even going to sleep and waking up, we believe that we're actually going to go to sleep, and then we believe that we're actually going to wake up, but we can't believe that God is real. You believe that every time that you have looked at me, your lungs are functioning, without even knowing that your lungs are functioning. And then when you focus on it, now you focus on your breathing. It's tunnel vision. We're so tunnel vision on the things of life, money, power, pleasure. And Solomon said it's meaningless, meaningless. It's all meaningless without God. Vanity upon vanities is smoke that blows in the wind. So I know I'm all over the place, but see it, see it, see it with me. Look at the bridge. Look at the bridge that is built to connect her to Jesus. 
the bridge that we have to be to be walked on, the situations that we have to go to. Sometimes we have to be the 12-year-old girl dying so that the 25-year-old, 30-year-old woman who's been suffering all her life can get the healing. It took the faith of her to believe, to touch, to immediately be healed. And then Jesus is saying, who touched me? And then she was so scared because of life's trauma of knowing that she's not supposed to be touching people if she's unclean, that when he found her, she didn't even wait for him to, to, to talk. Matthew doesn't put it in there. Luke only gives a small portion, but Mark puts it plainly in there that she declared, that she sat still and she trembled in fear. Why is she afraid of the trauma? What was she thinking that Jesus was going to do to her for touching the hem of his garment? Now the reality kicks in, I don't know this man. That everybody she's ever met through all the years that she's been bleeding has beat her down for doing something that's human, which is existing. She goes to Jesus to feel human again. She goes to Jesus to stop bleeding. She goes to Jesus because he's the only fix to life. The traumas made her scared. She broke down and she tells Jesus everything. And the first time she's labeled in his book, Jesus says, daughter. Imagine going 12 years with nobody recognizing you. You can't talk to your father, your mother, the people that you love. You can't even get a hug or an embrace. And the first time that you can get a hug and an embrace, and I get emotional when I, when I preach because it's deep. The first time you get an embrace, the very first man you know not only stops all the trauma, stops all the pain, stops all the agony, but then he labels you as his daughter. He gives you a love and a warm feeling from just a word. But he not only gives her the word of daughter, but then he embraces her. And he says, your faith has made you heal today. What does it feel like to have the loving embrace of Jesus? To go through life not knowing a purpose, not having a destination, not understanding your own purpose in life because everything that you've ever known was wrong. And you get to the man and he changes your life with a word, with a touch, with the simplest of touch. Then she declares, first we're healed. Then we repent. How can we repent if we don't even know that we're sick? How can we repent if we're not healed? See, most of us believe that we repent and then we are healed. But no, you're healed, then you repent. What would you have to repent for if you don't even recognize that you're in sin? She's healed. She declares to the world that she's been healed. She declares all of her problems, her traumas, that yes, I was unclean. Yes, I was a filthy rag. Yes, I was dirty. Yes, none of the society have accepted me for the past 12 years, but here I am today, clean. My slate growing up was rough, but Jesus, from a touch, from a word, from a whisper, from just existing, has made us, me, my family, clean. I can stop internal bleeding because he has stopped my bleeding. What is it like to walk in the shoes of someone who's in agony? You wanna, we, can, we can keep going down even further. The 12 year old girl after she's, after the woman who's been bleeding for 12 years is healed. Jesus is walking and the crowd continues to follow. He goes in there and he heals her after she dies. The soldier beforehand comes back and lets the master know that she, your daughter is dead. Your faith, pretty much, kick it out the window. It's pointless. This man ain't even that powerful. He can't get her back from the dead. So leave this man alone and let him go about his business. Woman just got healed. Her life was changed. But the daughter had to be a bridge. The 12-year-old girl had to be the bridge for her to get saved. We have to move out of our old crowds and get in a new crowd and risk the chance of being exposed just 
to get saved. And even when you are, I guarantee many still didn't believe that she was. Just like how when we convert from our sinless, selfish ways to getting into Jesus Christ, most of the people still don't believe that the change is real. Because they're seeing the 12 years of bleeding and they're not seeing the eternity of healing. The Bible says there's life and death in the tongue. And when Jesus said, as she arrives, the girl got up. She didn't stay dead. But Jesus, who he is, the, the servant to the master, Jarius, if I'm saying his name wrong, I'm so sorry. But the master pleads, begs, gets on his knees to a man he doesn't know. Faith to come from where he was to get to him. He said, if you lay hands, but we all know Jesus don't got to lay the hands on her. He speaks it, she's healed. He goes back, tells her, get up, she's healed. But some of us are the little girl. Sometimes we are not the ones bleeding, but we're the ones dying. Spiritually, physically, emotionally, dying until the point that we're dead. And some of us in this room were dead. Down so low that we thought nothing, no one, no faith, no belief, no food, no family could realive the solid stony heart and make it flesh again. But Jesus grabs us and tells us to get up. And just like the little girl, after we have to be an example so that Jesus can heal someone else so that we can now get our healing can get up and live again. But what's the point of living again if you do nothing with it? He tell, then tells them, don't tell anybody what I've done here today. Don't tell a soul well, that I just raised your daughter from the dead. You know how miraculous that is? To take a dead man like me and make him love again? Make him beat again and, 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 and make him forgive those who did wrong. How much power and authority and belief it takes to believe that some man that you've never seen that lived thousands of years ago can do the same thing he did for that lady, for me, and that little girl for me, and for us. How sweet. How sweet is the sound. We sing songs and hymns to a man that we've never even saw, but we know how. How do you know? Because he gives me a promise and he guarantees me that if you just believe that this life, this suffering, everything that you're going through now, the, the 60 something years, the 80 something years of bleeding will be gone after this. From the moment you're born, you die, but once you die, you live. We think, the time is permanent, but it's not every day that you're living, you're dying. But yet, most of us wait till the deathbed. Most of us wait till we're the man next to Jesus on the cross to say, remember me, when all we had to do was in the middle believe. And some of us are still going to be idiotic and say, you know what, save me and save yourself. And die, even though we're the ones in the wrong. How much faith does it take to change your life? And even if it doesn't change, because I, you know, I'm not a prosperity person, even if it doesn't change, even if your life stays the same, are you willing to have the reward after? Is your hopes and dreams, is your heart beating enough for you to believe in after? We sing songs like Two Wings, to veil my face in two wings, to veil my feet in two wings, to fly away. And we sing mansion in, with, a, in a, uh, with a golden crown. And we sing all these hymns to Jesus, but do you really believe? He said, you would know my people by the fruits that they bear. She bare the fruit of faith to even get to him. And the daughter bare the fruit of belief by even getting up. How much? Do you love him? It's what I ask every time. I'll tell this to you guys. Um, 
reach for the youth. Reach as far down as Jesus reached for Peter when he doubted and fell into that lake, to that water. Reach even further than he did. And grab everybody that's younger than you, older than you, lost in the waves and winds of life. Pick them up and put them on your back and be the bridge. Are you willing to be the bridge? Most of you are. You've already accepted the calling, but now are you willing to get your hands dirty? Because sometimes it may not be water, it may be mud. And sometimes it may not be mud, it may be blood. And sometimes people have to go through traumatic stuff to end up where I am and where you are. I know we love as people to shelter even the youth and the older who are ignorant, all ages and all sizes, ignorance is a thing. Why batter, why bruise, why ridicule like she did, like she got? Why not instead pick them up and love on them and teach them? The Bible says, teach a child in a way that they shall go and they'll never depart. It never said they'll do it right away. They said, when we get about you guys' age, probably a little younger, because y'all still young too, don't, don't believe you're not young. That then we'll understand. How long did it take for you guys to understand your parents' words when they were living? How long did it, is it taken us even still to listen to Jesus' words and follow after the Father? Now, how much more patience are you willing to have? Because she went 12 years, and the daughter went a few hours, and she died and got brought back. You died and got brought back. Are you willing to proclaim that Jesus has risen? Are you willing to be proud and loving and reach for the stars and grab everybody you can find, even if you got to drag them? I say, just listen for a second. I guarantee your life will be changed. The youth cries out every day, but nobody answers. In their eyes, but in God's eyes, he's there. But if only they would take off the blinders and just see him, maybe then, maybe then, they can experience stopping of the bleeding. He died on the cross for us so that we can have a chance. Now we got our chance. There's a million more lost people out there. There's a billion more lost people out there. Are you willing to be walking on the streets, picking up the homeless, and even sitting down with them to share a meal and to talk with them? What about the orphans that have no father or mother that need guidance? If your nephew or your niece won't listen, find somebody who will. He said, if we won't worship, the rocks will cry out. And are we not better than the rocks? <clears throat> find that person that's bleeding. We don't have Jesus today. We got us. We got Jesus in us. We got the Holy Spirit in us. Find that person that's bleeding and be their cure. Find that little girl that's dying and be that cure. That bleeding could be a wrongdoing by a mother, father, cousin, uncle, friend that touched her the wrong way, or that touched him the wrong way. It could be an eternal pain from a heartbreak that's never got healed because nobody was available to talk. How much? Are you willing to take out your own pocket so that the next person can have what you have? Are you willing to stop the bleeding? Thank you. One more time, let's give God some praise for Brother Genesis Henry. He's one of the four-year ministerial students here at Southwestern, and it's good to know that uh, Southwestern is still in the business of shaping and molding and producing great gospel preachers. Amen, somebody? Amen. Amen. Well, at this time, uh, we're going to transition into the next portion of our, uh, our session this morning. 
we have two powerful and dynamic uh, men of God, two lecturers that will come before us and they will uh, present us with information and um, with regards to biblical leadership in postmodern times. Uh, it doesn't take us much to look around and realize that we are in need of leadership, amen? Uh, this world needs strong, powerful leaders, but not just strong, powerful leaders, godly leaders, amen? And so this is a very pertinent uh, topic and subject, and we are, uh, we are in good hands in, uh, as two of our presenters, none other than Dr. Jefferson Carruthers and Dr. Kenneth Gilmore. They're going to come before us, and they will uh, present to us uh, on the topic biblical leadership in post-modern times. Now, yesterday we got going, and I mean, I don't anticipate today being anything less. Uh, we're just going to continue going higher and higher and deeper and deeper because these are two great men of God who have a wealth of knowledge and wisdom to share with us, and it's only going to enrich our hearts, amen, and make us better, better equip us to lead uh, from day to day. And so after a verse of a psalm, we will hear uh, first from none other than Dr. Jefferson Carruthers. I really love the Lord. I really love the I love him. Oh, I, I really love the Lord. Say it again. I really love the Lord. Oh, I, I really love, I love the Lord. Oh, Good morning, uh, everybody. Good to see you on this morning, and we trust uh, that you had a restful night on <clears throat> last night, and that you've had um, a good morning on this morning. We're thankful for what has transpired uh, thus far, and we're thankful for uh, the young man uh, who came and uh, delivered the message on this morning, as well as those of you who have participated uh, in the devotional uh, period. As I understand it, um, we are going to have um, these uh, presentations this morning from myself and uh, Brother Gilmore. And then after, after lunch, we will come in for a, a panel discussion. I want to thank uh, Dr. Seamster as well as uh, the board of Southwestern Christian College for affording us this opportunity to have this conversation uh, on this morning. And it's good to see those of you whom I have known over uh, the years, and we're thankful that you are still maintaining 
the uh, faith uh, and that you're not ashamed, amen, to uh, maintain that uh, faith. But the good things about uh, this morning is that uh, is a, a lecture and uh, so you don't have to worry about uh, me uh, necessarily saying to you that you miss your shout uh, because there may not be anything to be shouting about. Amen. You don't have to uh, worry about me uh, saying uh, this morning uh, uh, as well, come a little closer, uh, uh, various phrases that we use when uh, we, are, we are preaching uh, because this is a lecture and we're thankful uh, for this lecture uh, moment. Now, it's going to be a little difficult uh, for some during the afternoon hour to kind of interact with what we said on this morning, which was the uh, objective, uh, because they will not have heard it. And so if you come back on this afternoon, you will be legitimate. Uh, you can legitimately ask questions about leadership uh, in modern uh, times. As was mentioned, um, uh, my name is Jefferson Carruthers. I attended school here in 1979, 1980, uh, 1981. Uh, my, one of my roommates uh, is here, uh, Brother Harold Rollinson, uh, who's here uh, on this morning. It's good to see him uh, still able to walk and talk after 40 years and be up on his feet uh, at this time. And we're just thankful for that. And, and of course, always good to see uh, those uh, who are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and are encouraging people uh, in the uh, faith. Um, we enjoyed a few years ago uh, a trip to uh, Israel and Jordan, and we're thankful for that trip um, and uh, sharing and still being able to have fellowship with one another. Again, I'm talking about leadership in modern time. I want, I want to, as a book in, begin with a text from 1 Samuel chapter 2 and uh, verse 27, 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse number 27, which will kind of set the tone uh, for how I am making this approach on this one. Again, I know this last night uh, with a microphone, I don't know if there are a couple of microphones, but this microphone goes in and out uh, during the delivery. I don't know if there is a, another one, but uh, it would help uh, on that because we miss a few words every now and then. Thank you. Thank you, young man. First Samuel chapter 2 and verse number 27. It begins with these words, and there came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, did I plainly appear unto the house of your father when you were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house lecture. We have students oftentimes um, in our lectures, those of us who teach school, and they are often uh, in the class looking for what will be on the test, what they have to uh, remember how is how is the presentation structured? I want uh, you to know, know on this morning that uh, during the time that I have, I want to cover three different uh, thought patterns in the structure. First of all, I'm going to talk about the postmodern realm, and a little bit of that I'll talk about what known as modernism, and then what is known as postmodernism, and then I'll engage that word postmodern. The second thing we we'll talk about is, is leadership. Um, and, and of course, the church needs leadership. And then finally on this morning, in preparation for this afternoon, we're gonna talk about modern day conversations for leadership. And we began with 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 27, where if you are familiar with your biblical history, we have just, uh, we are concluding the period of the judges in the book of Judges and the first few chapters of, of 1 Samuel. We have uh, journeyed with Moses through the wilderness, with Joshua in the settling of the land, and then that period of time for nearly 400 years of the judges. 
We're, we'll be talking about a woman in the first chapters of 1 Samuel, and that's important in our modern culture. If you watch uh, MSNBC, if you watch CNN, if you watch Fox, one of the things, one of the narratives is about the Bible that uh, women are kind of excluded from any role of leadership or any role of importance in the Bible. I hear oftentimes even those who are members of the body of Christ and been in the body of Christ repeat the narratives that they hear on television. And when they say that, what the, the point they mean to make is that even God did not did not favor women. Even God left out the significance and the importance of, of women. That's a narrative that leaders have to deal with in our society. But what a person demonstrates is that that person probably is not reading the Bible. Some years ago when I was in college at David Lipscomb, many of us students used to watch programs like Young and the Restless. And I remember, um, and, and other, other all my children, I remember, I think it was Erica that was in, in all my children. And she was reading the Bible one time in one of the episodes of All My Children or, or Young and the Restless. And, and um, she was reading from the book of Corinthians. She was reading from the book of, of Corinthians and she was saying something about what the book of Corinthians said. The problem was anybody that was reading the Bible knew that she was probably no far further in the Bible than the book of Genesis. But she's supposed to be reading from the book of 1 Corinthians. Well, she did not know the Bible. The Bible was just a prop. And with many Christians, sadly, the Bible is just a prop. When I hear people talk about God excluding women and, and God not recognizing women, I, I realize they're probably not reading the Bible. How can you say that uh, when you get to, to the Bible in the book of Judges and Deborah is a warrior? How, how can you say that when you're reading the book of Judges and it was a woman jailed that nailed a, a pig through the warrior's head? How can you say that in the book of Judges when it was a woman who uh, dropped a, a, a millstone on Hithophel's head? How, how can you say that when Samson's mother was barren and bore Samson. How can you read the book of Judges and then go into another book that was a period of the Judges and the focus is on two women, Naomi and Ruth. And you know, Ruth married Boaz and Boaz had Obed and Obed had Jesse and Jesse had David. How, how can you say that? But you don't get to David until you get to 1 Samuel when you're dealing with another woman by the name of Hannah who had a, a partner, uh, another woman who was married to her husband, uh, Penina, and she becomes a hero because she's going to dedicate Samuel to the Lord. When a person says that God does not hold up women or use them significantly in the Bible, I realize that I'm dealing with someone who has the same problem many people have in the church today. They have ceased to read their Bibles. And one of the things leaders must do is they must read their Bibles so that they can combat the narratives that we hear in society today. Well, I, I mentioned 1 Samuel chapter 2 because What's going on here is that God has blessed Hannah with a child, Samuel, who she dedicated to the Lord. But then chapter 2 gets into Eli and his two sons, uh, Hophni and Phinehas. Hophni and Phinehas were church boys. They, uh, let's, let's call them faith boys. They, they were around Shiloh. They were around the altar. The problem was they did not take the meat when they should have the meat. They, they took it while it was cooked, rather, or rather while it was whole, rather than cooked. And the other thing was they slept with the women who came to worship, came to honor God. Seemed like the world hadn't changed. We still got some jokers in religion who believe that their responsibility is to take what's not theirs and to sleep with the women. But I want you to understand, in the midst of that, God wants Eli to correct his sons. And Eli tries to correct his son, but Eli's son Eli's sons ignore them, and that's when the text says in 1 Samuel 2, 27, and there came a man of God. And the text says in verse 27, the man of God says, thus saith the Lord. I believe my responsibility this morning as a man of God is to communicate what thus saith the Lord. Not what thus saith the church of modern times, not what thus saith the men, not what thus says women, not what thus says society, not what is said in academia, but what thus says the Lord. And it's because a lot of preachers 
don't recognize the importance of being a man of God that they want to be called a whole lot of other things in our brotherhood today because to be a man of God is not significant, is not, not important. But, but even as Paul was about to leave, he said to Timothy, and from a child, you know the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect thoroughly furnished unto all good works. If I were to pray about leadership this morning, I would begin by praying, God, equip the man of God. God, inform the man of God. God, strengthen the man of God so that the man of God would remember that his responsibility is to preach and teach what thus says the Lord. And oftentimes, that's not going to be what society wants to hear is not going to be what your church members want to hear. It may not be what your peers want to hear. But the man of God doesn't belong to those other entities. The man of God belongs to God and speaks what thus says the Lord. Now, some of the things that I shall say on this morning will not be what is popular, not not, not what is fashionable, not what is politically correct, but what thus says the Lord. A man of God came to correct Eli. Modernism, modernism, leadership uh, in a postmodern world. There are some words that have been used recently philosophically and theolo uh, theologically that have to do with the thought of what modernism is and then postmodernism is, and then some people talk about a postmodern world. One of the things the man of God must communicate is what Solomon had to communicate when it comes to the people of God. And we'll get to this. Um, after all of these years, all these centuries, all the millennia, I think Solomon is still correct. There is nothing new under the sun. One of the words that we kind of denigrate in our society is the word tradition. And what we mean by that are certain behaviors that uh, people engage in, certain dynamics that are part of the community, and then we castigate, we denigrate the word tradition. Religion is in Christ, in Yahweh, in God, will always be tradition. The very nature of faith is to be built upon traditions. You cannot escape tradition. And I know people mean by that the traditions of men, which is good to make the distinction between the traditions of the Bible and the traditions of men. But uh, faith will always be traditional. Faith will always be a part of what is archaic and old because it's a word that endures through generations and there's nothing new under the sun. Remember the words, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man is the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower thereof fades away, falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. The word of the Lord is there before the will, there's the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord is there before there's any mode of transportation, the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord is not impact, impacted by, by technology. It's not impacted by how quickly one can get from one destination to the other. The word of the Lord will always be there. The word of the Lord is not impacted, is not changed by how we do community, whether we stay in the inner city, whether we stay in the inner suburbs or the outer suburbs, or whether we stay in a rural area, the word of the Lord is always the same. The word of the Lord, the word of the Lord endures through, through generations and the word of the Lord endures through technology. Nothing has changed about the word of the Lord and there's nothing new under the sun. A few years ago, Churches of Christ planned their annual calendar focusing on the need of, of hosting gospel meetings. 
gospel meetings, they called them, attending gospel meetings of sister congregations, looking for ground to raise tents for tent meetings, training adults to do home Bible studies, showing home movies, emphasizing cottage studies, and a host of other activities focused on fulfilling the goal of um, taking the gospel to all the world. These churches would be considered churches that envisioned themselves as churches, if you talk about culture, they would consider themselves as churches against culture. And when you think about the church, you can think about the church in terms of the church in culture, the church against culture, or the church versus culture. Where, well, oftentimes with an eschatological view, they uh, saw themselves as churches that were different from, from culture and looking for the end days. And in the meantime, while they were there, they wanted to save as many souls as possible. The generations following had a different agenda. The, the first expects that churches must have, uh, must, must have gospel meetings and teaches people to bring people to Christ. Uh, they need to know the word of God. They need to be able to share the word of God. They need to be able to talk about Jesus, the death, burial, and resurrection. They needed to be able to talk about life in Christ. And life in Christ was supposed to be different from life outside of Christ. And the other thing that was taught in that is that it was possible to live a godly life. Do you remember that? When they said it was possible to live a godly life? For, take, for example, marriage. They, they used to say that you could make a promise and a covenant with someone and keep that promise and that covenant all of your life. This, this phrase, till death do you part. Remember when they used to say that was possible? I, I, I've been married almost 40 years. And I think about it sometimes. I think about being uh, 20, 20, 22, 23 years old. And I'm saying to this woman here, my wife, who's here this morning, who is about, you know, a certain age as well, amen. And, and, and I'm, I'm standing before a preacher, and I'm saying before the preacher, I take this woman to be my wedded wife, to love, to hold, to cherish. I take her to be my wedded wife through sickness and death, whether rich or poor. And then I'm saying, to death do we part. And I'm up here 23 years old, and I'm believing you can actually do that. And I believe you could do that because the folk didn't have any better sense than to teach me you could do that if you wanted to and if God be your help. And here it is 40 years later. I'm in my 60s now and, and God is right. If we want to do right, he can help us to do right. We used to teach folk, you don't have to give in to sin every day of your life. You don't have to live like the world. You can be committed. You can keep your word. You can stay married. You can do what's right. But we teach people today, well, you know, we all sin, all of sin, and falling short of the glory of God. And it becomes our escape phrase for not allowing God to help us to live like we're supposed to live. I, I said we used to teach at the Church of Christ we could actually walk upright yes, and do what God says to do. Well, we changed in our mindset a, a church that's trying to impact culture by bringing them to Christ, to making our responsibility to save culture by meeting culture's physical needs first. And here comes another one of those haven't been reading the Bible issues. You've heard it like I've heard it. People won't know that you care. Uh, people want to know that you care before you share. And what they meant by that is that unless you heal the hurts of the community first, then they don't want to hear the gospel. That's Erica Cain again. When you read the stories in the Bible, Jesus did not feed people before he taught people. He taught the people he fed. Now, if I were preaching tonight, I'd say, you missed your shout. But I said I wasn't going to say that. You look at the cases where Jesus fed 5,000. When Jesus fed people, he was always feeding people who had been following him. And some of them had been following him for days at a time. So no, he didn't feed them first and then teach them. He taught them and then because they had been following him, he fed them. He did not feed them because they were poor necessarily. Remember the apostle said, you want us to send these people into town so they can buy victuals? 
They were not broke. They were not poor. They were following Jesus, but the apostles believed they had the ability to go buy something. Jesus says, that's all right. I'll feed them right here. We need to read our Bibles. But we have begun a culture in our churches that say, don't tell, uh, teach anybody the gospel until you first set up your soup kitchen, hand out a coat, sneakers, book bag, take the blood pressure, pressure and make sure the diabetes is all right. That, 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 that's, that's, not, that's not how the Bible did. And there came a man of God. It says, thus saith the Lord. But in this mindset, our churches are content now to believe they are doing the work of God because of their health fairs, because of their feedings, and things of that nature. And they believe that when you do that, then people will be sensitive to hearing what you have to say. But let's take the test case. Jesus feeds 5,000, right? John chapter 5, John chapter 6. John chapter 6, he feeds 5,000, and then he gets to the message. Now, remember, he'd already been teaching them. Now he feeds them. Now he's going to teach them again. He taught, fed, and now he's going to teach them again. He teaches them again. Y'all are feeling pretty good now, but I tell you, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part from you. Think Moses was the one who gave you bread in the wilderness. I'm the bread uh, 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 of God that came down from heaven, and you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And the text says, many people say that's a hard thing, and many of them... Just fed, turn and walk no more with him. You mean to tell me you're going to fill your belly? And she said, you're not following me because you saw the miracles. You, you're following miracles, but you're following me because uh, you, you ate, ate and you were filled. That's why you're following me. If anybody can say to us, eating is not going to convert them, Jesus can say to us, that's not what converts people. What converts people is understanding who Jesus is. And understanding what God sent him to do for our sins. So many of them turn and walk no more with him. And Jesus looks at his apostles and said, y'all going to? Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Uh, for we believe and assure that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. But we turned our attention away from coming to Bible school and knowing the Bible and sharing the Bible. And admitting its power to thinking that our love and compassion was what's going to convert people. What the Bible says in the Gospel of Mark is that Jesus had compassion on the people. And the next phrase says, and he taught them. Teaching is compassion. When you teach people about the love of God, you are showing compassion. We used to teach people about the blood of Jesus Christ, and now we're taking their blood pressure. Amen. Well, taking blood pressure is not going to save people. They can think that we're sympathetic and all of that, and they may appreciate the fact that they didn't have, have to pay anything when they went to the doctor. But ultimately, Church of Christ, ultimately, man of God, what we share with people is the word of God. That, and what put Jesus on the cross was not our illnesses, was not our shortcomings financially. What put Jesus on the cross was our sin. Amen. The cross is about sin. And a lot of our preaching today, this health, wealth, and wholeness preaching that we oftentimes condemn, we're preaching it ourselves. What we're saying to people is that Jesus died on the cross so you can get a raise on your job. Jesus died on the cross so that you can climb the, the ladder of success. Jesus died on the cross because he wants all of your neighbors to get along with you. Jesus died on the cross so that when you go uh, to the doctor, the, the doctor will say you can get off of metformin and hydrochlorothiazide and some of that other stuff you own. That's why he died on the cross. Jesus died on the cross because we are sinners. He took our sins to the cross and died there so that his righteousness, 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, 23 through 25, so that his righteousness could become our righteousness, who his own self bear our sins on the cross. Ladies and gentlemen, what we needed help from God with was our sins. Amen. And so the methodology changed, the, the emphasis changed. And even today, the emphasis has changed again when we have bought into the notion 
that people for the first time ever in their lives are meeting difficulties in life and culture that they have never met before. But back to Solomon's sage writings, when he writes that there's nothing new under the sun, what he's saying is that men and women have been the same through generation after generation. And if we don't believe that, we just need to look at the Bible again. It's not, this is not the first time that people have to deal, have, to, have had to deal with family problems and societal problems. Right from the beginning, the Bible teaches that Eve had a shortcoming. Remember Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 12. Cain murders Abel, Genesis 4 and verse number 8. Lamech is involved in senseless killing, Genesis 4 and 23. Man's thoughts are evil continually in Noah's day, uh, Genesis 6 and 1. Noah himself gets drunk, uh, Noah, uh, J- uh, Genesis 9 and 2. Ham gazed on his father's nakedness, uh, Genesis 9, 22. Abraham lied about his wife, Genesis chapter 12. I'm telling you, there's nothing new under the sun. Dinah is raped when she goes out to visit other women, Genesis 34 and 5. J- Jacob's son, Simeon and Levi, uh, deceive and murder exercising genocide on those who raped their sister, Genesis 34 and 25. Tamar is lied to by Judah, Genesis 38 and 11. And then uh, their families go through all kinds of trouble, Genesis 37 and 39. I'm telling you, there is nothing new under the sun. This is not the first time that women have not been treated right, women have been raped, men have been raped, folk have committed murder, and what folk need to hear today is what they needed to hear throughout history and time and that is there is a God who is in control of the affairs of man and what man needs today is what man has always needed and that is a word from the Lord we began again first Samuel chapter 2 verse 27 and we said in the midst of Eli's sons doing all kinds of evil the Bible says in first Samuel 2 and verse number 27 and there came a man of God and said thus saith the Lord well modernism was the thought that there was uh, objective truth dealt with the rational mind it comes out of the enlightenment in Rene Descartes where they believed that man could come to truth uh, objectively and And what's important about that is that people believe that there was objective truth. The modern, postmodern mind said there is no truth. That is truth for everybody. There is no final word from the Lord. There is no objective truth. And rather than focusing on the truth that was for everybody, people began thinking about their own internal truth. And they began using words like, I'm spiritual, uh, but I'm not religious. And I think my truth is as good as your truth. And what makes your truth better than my truth? And and how do you know the Bible is right? We can't all see the Bible alike. And we're, we're going to come to different conclusions about the Bible. That's the postmodernist mind that says there, there, there's nothing that we can all agree on. So we must might as well accept that you're going to believe it like you want to believe it. And I'm going to believe it like I'm going to believe it. And, and, and it's really not necessary that we have agreement with what we're doing. You, you do your thing and I'll do my thing. And, and, and how that worked with the church, with leaders, the leaders would say at their church, our church does it this way and your church can do it that way. And we don't have to agree because after all, we can't all see it alike. And when our churches talk like that, they don't even understand that they have been caught up in the postmodernist mindset. The postmodernist mindset where elderships try to lead by saying, well, this is what we have decided for our people. And we're the local church. And we have to remind the people of God that the church is not only local. The church is global. Church is global. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, one of those phrases, another one of those phrases that we castigate and denigrate is the word brotherhood, brotherhood. When I was in school and after school, sometimes preachers would make excuses for not being invited anywhere, and they would say, well, I'm not a brotherhood preacher. Y'all remember, remember that, Brother Robinson? I'm not a brotherhood preacher. As if being a brotherhood preacher was something nasty and dirty. 
1 Timothy 2.17. You got to honor all men. You got to honor the king. And you love the brotherhood. God did not just make us one enclave of believers. When Peter writes those words in 1 Peter 2.17... He's writing to several provinces. You know your Bibles, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. He's writing to several churches. These are the ones who said, these are the ones to whom he writes, don't suffer as a murderer, or an evildoer, or a busybody in other men's matters. But if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. He's not writing to one congregation. He's writing to several. And he's telling the collective of congregations what their mindset should be. And the mindset is you love the brotherhood. The modernist mind, irrational. There is objective truth. We can come to similar conclusions. The postmodernist mind, we cannot all see the Bible alike. You do your thing, I'll do my thing. I said, first, what I want to do is introduce to you the thought, what, is, what do people mean by the modernist mind? What do people believe about the postmodernist mind? What do people believe about postmodern? Sometimes what they believe about postmodern is that we're beyond a certain generation and age and the dynamics that uh, were part of that generation and age and because because you have millennials or you have generation x and you have and then you have you know the certain generations that 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 they each need something different well they may be dealing with life differently but i, I want you to understand this this morning they all need the word of god and the same sin that affected men in the garden is the sin that affects men and women today. So we're talking about leadership, the second part this morning, leadership. If ever there were a day that we needed leadership that is biblical leadership, that day is today. We have issues with instrumental music in churches of Christ, issues with nomenclature in churches of Christ, issues with even speaking up to what occurs in society, I said at the national lectureship, it is amazing that uh, the largest denominational church in the United States is uh, the largest denominational gathering is the Southern Baptist Convention. The Southern Baptist Convention has one of the larger churches in this in this country with the Saddleback community and, and Rick Warren and all over the newspapers are talking about what's going on in the Southern Baptist Convention. One of the things they're arguing about in the Southern Baptist Convention is who is a pastor and who is not a pastor. Watch this. They're arguing about in the Southern Baptist Convention who is a pastor and who is not a pastor. What Rick Warren did that upset the Southern Baptist Convention was first make his wife a pastor and then change the definition of what a pastor was so that he eventually got kicked out of the Southern Baptist Convention. This church is baptized when you talk about baptism more people than anybody in the United States. That, 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 that denomination that it has, it's all over the world. And they're talking about pastors. And who is a pastor? And Rick Warren thought because of his status and because of his 40 days of purpose and because of the books that he written that the Southern Baptist Convention would bow to his newfound ideas about pastor but the Baptist scholars and here's the thing about scholarship scholarship has to be honest or scholarship loses credibility you can't be a scholar and be dishonest you can't go with what's popular you have to go with what the text says and so he appealed the decision of being kicked out of the Southern Baptist Convention he appealed it and they got the scholars together and they asked the scholars say well what does the text say and here's what the Southern Baptist scholar said. The text says that a pastor is a man. And I'm sorry, Rick Warren, you made your wife a pastor, but that's not what the text says. They said the text says not only is a pastor a man, but biblically speaking, no pastor 
served as a singular leader of a church. This is Baptist. But that they serve with other pastors as an eldership because older men led God's people. And the reason there was more than one is because one of the main duties of elders was to be a witness. And whenever you had someone be a witness, nothing could be established by one witness, but in the mouths of two or three witnesses must every word be established. And they took Rick Warren to Bible school and teaching him, you know, for example, that when they wanted to know whether or not Boaz could marry Ruth, they brought them before the gate and the elders sit down to witness that. When you engage that conversation in Churches of Christ because we no longer care, some of us, about what the Bible says, international national news with the Baptists becomes petty in Churches of Christ. And we start saying things like, is that a heaven or hell issue? Before I close this morning, I only have a few minutes left. I'm going to show you that in faith and religion, words matter. And if you're a student of the Bible, not only do words matter, but little spots in a word matter. So that Jesus says the law is not going to pass. And that every yod and tittle. What do you mean yod and tittle? The yod is a little small letter in the Hebrew alphabet. It's the smallest letter. The tittle is what we call a T is the largest T. What Jesus says, the law is not going to pass from the very smallest letter to the very largest letter. In religion, words always matter. So let's go back to Erica. Have we been reading our Bibles? And let's go to 1 Samuel 2, 27. And then came a man of God. And said, thus saith the Lord. Right? In leaders, so, so, so we're calling petty what a church of 10,000 members was rejected for. I said also at the National Lectureship that in the United Methodist Churches, you, re you have historically witnessed one of the greatest realignments in religion in the last 100 years. The United Methodist Church has split almost in half. There's now not just the United Methodist Church, it's what's called the Global Methodist Church. Read your, read your newspaper, it's just about every, every week, some United Church is backing away from another United Methodist Church and they're calling themselves Global Methodist Church. Here's what they're arguing over. Pastors and the LGBTQ community. Their argument is not about whether a man or woman could be a pastor. Their argument is about whether someone who's practicing in the LGBTQ community can be a pastor. And because the United Methodist Church is a more of a cultural church, that is, it keeps up with what's going on in culture rather than what's in their Bibles. Just about every modern movement the United Methodist Church has accepted and made a part of their dynamic and a part of their worship. And so they have people who practice in the LGBTQ community who want to be pastors. And, and what the global Methodists say who have split from them, you know, in these days you can Google everything. What I'm just saying, the global Methodist Church says we can't go that far because it's not biblical. Because not only is a pastor a man, but he marries a woman. Two large denominations. Baptist, Methodist, Church of Christ. Silence. Won't say a word. I say we need leadership. We won't say a word because Sometimes, like the United Methodists, we're more concerned about being like society than we are being concerned with what thus says the Lord. 
So in leadership, you need a man of God who understands that his role is not to please the elders or the deacons or the women or the men or the children, but to speak what thus says the Lord. Responsibility is not to walk with culture, not to walk with the mindset of the geniuses of our time, but you need somebody who's going to say, here's what God says, and it's in God's word. And so why are we quiet oftentimes about homosexuality? There's a Facebook post that's real popular. Some of our members post it often, and I try not to respond to it all the time. It, it, it goes like this. If you're struggling with alcohol, come to church anyhow. If you're struggling with sexual identity, come to church anyhow. If you're living with someone that you're not married to, come to church anyhow. And our church members like it, and then they repost it because they say God wants, it, wants us all. Problem is, that's not biblical. So let's go back to 1 Samuel 2, 27. And there came a man of God. What the Bible actually teaches in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is if you're in sin, what the church is supposed to do is deliver you to Satan. And Paul made sure that the church understood it this way. He says, now, I wrote to you in a letter not to company with fornicators, but I'm not talking about the fornicators of the world because if you uh, had to stop associating with all the fornicators of the world, you got to go out of the world. That's not possible. You can't go out of the world. He said, but if any man be called a brother... See, living together members are not supposed to be at church teaching Bible class. Young men and young women in the church who are living together are not supposed to be over the youth group. The woman in the church who's a good teacher but won't marry a man but she got a man is not the ladies Bible class teacher. We need leadership in the church. How do we get to the point that the person talking about marriage can't stay married and the person who is married can't say a word? Huh? It used to be if you're going to talk about marriage, at least you stayed in your marriage and you were successful in your marriage. Now we got all of the folk who've been divorced all of these times of telling folk how to get married. We got all the young people who can't keep themselves to themselves teaching the young people out of heavy young people. One of the things I appreciated about my high school in Santa Ana, California, we were sitting there one day and the speaker came in and a bunch of guys took yellow pages and ripped them up with their bare hands. Young people, they were Christians and they were saying to us, you know what, you don't like the world you don't have to be like the world be a child of God and you'll have strength not only physically you have strength spiritually you don't have to have children in while you're young you don't have to have, uh, date a bunch of women while you're young you can forgotten I'm not against those who made mistakes saying yes I got pregnant when I was 15 or yes I got divorced when I was four but I'm saying every once in a while the girl who kept herself ought to be able to be the speaker on the ladies program. We don't need just to teach people that they have been forgiven. We need people who can teach people how to hold out and hold on to Jesus. Leadership, finally this morning, finally this morning, I, I asked them yesterday why they gave us so much time. <laughs> and Robert Bird thought I was kidding. I said, that's a lot of time. Um, and I said, well, we'll see what we do with that. I said this morning, we're going to talk about postmodernism. We're going to talk about the need of leadership. We'll address some of this later on. But modern day conversations, um, brotherhood. You cannot be a faithful member of the body of Christ and despise brotherhood. Leaders, there's no such thing as being in Christ, faithful and not in the church. People talk about, I'm, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe in church. Well, you don't believe the Bible. Because you can't be a Christian unless you're in the church. It takes Christ to put you in the church. It takes Christ to put you out the church. The church can withdraw from you fellowship-wise. But to be in Christ is to be in the body of Christ and be in the church. No such thing as being in Christ and faithful to Christ and not being somebody in the church. But then we have to understand this as well. 
that the church is not something we get to despise anyway. The church is the bride of Christ. He loved the church. He gave himself for the church. You don't talk about the bride of Christ like she's nasty and dirty. The Bible says he gave himself for the church that, that he might present it to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. I don't get to despise the church and call myself a faithful child of God. We're not praising that music. Here's where we're culpable. This, this, this is where we're guilty. If we really believe in churches of Christ, that God wants to hear what he created, the voice, not the instrument that we create, but the voice he created. Then why do we fellowship people who say they're in Christ, but use the mechanical instrument? See, we can't have it both ways, Church of Christ. Either you believe that God wants to hear the voice and you fellowship in worship with people who use the voice, or you don't believe and you fellowship with people in worship who use mechanical instruments of music. We got, where am I at? That's terrible. We got folk all over Dallas, popular preachers, who have brought instruments into their, their worship context. And then we'll say, we don't believe in the instruments, but then we'll invite that preacher to our event to teach us how to worship God. And then came a man of God. 1 Samuel 2, 27. Thus says the Lord. One of the things that happened some years ago is many of our members got hold of a book reading the Bible for all it's worth and they began to use this hermeneutical principle. The Bible could never mean what it did not mean in the first century. And a lot of us bought that uh, and that's good. It's fine to say that. And some people have argued here recently the Bible can't mean what it never meant. And in Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, 16, the text was not arguing against Old Testament mechanical instruments of music and the text perhaps was not even arguing about pagan instruments of music. It was just saying to people that Give God psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Well, the text can never mean what it never did mean. If it didn't mean using mechanical instruments of music in the first century, it can't mean that today. Did you get that? See, it can not only mean that it was not arguing against some things, but it cannot also mean that it was arguing for some things. If the text didn't intend to teach mechanical instruments of music then, then it cannot mean to teach mechanical instruments of music now. And then we have to remind folk in this country that mechanical instruments of music were not a part of the worship context for over a thousand years popularly. And if God could be praised with it then, when did God change that he needs it now? And I've criticized leadership elderships who have said, well, we're using the mechanical instruments of music because society wants it. We don't do things in the church because society wants it. Elderships say, we've come to the conclusion that God maybe doesn't have a problem with that, so we're going to an instrumental music worship. They are wrong. And then came a man of God and said, thus says the Lord. Let me end with this this morning. One of the things we, that I enjoyed in biblical studies under scholars is words. There's a Hebrew word, na'ar, na'ar, N-A, if we were to write it, we were to write N-A, singular apostrophe, like you're making a possession, A-R, it means young man. I had, I had, I had an assignment in PhD studies in Hebrew. And the professor said, I want you all to go out. I want you to look up the word na'ar, na'ar, na'ar. It's translated, it translated in the English text, oftentimes child or young person. Na'ar is a, is a warrior in some context. In some context. And I'll show you how a singular word can, can shape a society, shape a culture, shape a church. The text says about Samuel, in 1 Samuel 16, that he's one of uh, the sons of Jesse. And oftentimes when I would hear the story of, of uh, David, I'd hear about this little boy with a slingshot, and then a little boy with a slingshot was not one with the rubber band, but that you sling, remember? And you have the pictures of this young boy, usually between the ages of 8 and 11 years old, going up against this giant, and he's slinging this rock, 
And he's hitting this giant in the forehead and he's bringing him down. A little boy, 18, 11 years old. That's not what the word na'ar intends in the, in the Hebrew. It's a young warrior. David was not a little boy fighting a giant. He was a young man of pretty good size. But our curriculum that we got from our publishing houses had the picture of a young boy that we gave to our kids with a slingshot, bring it down, a giant, Na'ar. Abraham had 300 Na'arim, that's the plural of Na'ar, that he went out to fight with to bring Lot back. The text says about David before he even met, before he even met Goliath, that he was a warrior, a mighty warrior, a warrior man. Some of our young people have used that text to say when Saul uh, put the garments on him that they needed new garments because they couldn't wear the older garments. And they think that's the text the point the text is making. Well, there were not many people who could wear Saul's garments. Even David's other brothers who were older than he could, couldn't wear his. And they certainly could not wear Goliath because Goliath was a giant. That's not the point of the text either. But we make, we make up stories about our text because of a singular word that we ignore. And then you remember... David goes to that big giant when that giant is felled and he gets up on his chest and he takes the giant's sword and cuts his head off just a young boy. Well, that was not a young boy cutting Goliath's head off. That was a young warrior. And if Saul's sword were too heavy for David, how in the world did he pick up Goliath's sword? If he was a young, one word, Na'ar. There's a story of Elisha. Young boys come out and they tease him and, and, and Elisha sends the bear out. The bear goes and, and destroys 40 some young boys. And people say, how, how awful. The word in the text, two words, Na'ar and Yelet. Both of them are translated young men. The 40-some people who were attacked were not little boys. They were young warriors. See, little boys that had the sense to run from the bear. Some of those 19 and 20-year-olds ain't got sense enough to run. One word. And people have said, Jeff, you're just concerned about one word all the time. Let me tell you something, person. If you were a man of God, you'd come to understand and admit a word makes a difference. We'll talk about more of that this afternoon in the panel, hopefully, about how we inform our churches and lead our churches in this postmodern time as men of God. And I'm begging us to understand that we don't just need pastors in our brotherhood. We need preachers who preach the word of God. Stop trying to run around and have worldly titles rather than doing your job. Be a man of God who preaches the word. We thank you for your time on this morning. One more time for Dr. Carruthers, we thank you, sir. Thank you so much. We're gonna prepare for uh, our next uh, presenter, and that in the person of Dr. Kenneth Gilmore. He's gonna come before us. Uh, we have a few items that we need to get set up and prepare for him as he, uh, before he comes. And so, uh, as, he, as we are doing this, we'll offer up a song of praise preparation for Dr. Gilmore. I am a hard fighting soldier on the battlefield. I am a hard fighting soldier on the battlefield. I'm just
just a hard fighting soldier on the battlefield I keep on bringing souls to Jesus by the service that I give I'm just a hard fighting soldier on the battlefield and I'm just a hard fighting soldier on the battlefield I'm just a hard fighting soldier on the battlefield I keep on souls to Jesus by the service that I give. Well, you've got to walk right and talk right, sing right and pray right on the battlefield. You, you've got to walk right and talk right, sing right and pray right on the battlefield. You've got to walk right Talk right, sing right, pray right on the battlefield. I keep on bringing souls to Jesus by the service that I give. And I'm just a hard fighting soldier. I'm on the battlefield. I'm just a hard soldier on the battlefield. I'm just a hard fighting soldier on the battlefield. I keep on bringing souls to Jesus by the service that I Good morning. I'm so delighted to be here this morning to share uh, with you a, a portion of God's word as it relates to the subject matter that has uh, been assigned uh, to me. It is almost deja vu uh, to be uh, here in the auditorium because when I was an instructor here at Southwestern, when Dr. Seamster hired me, uh, this was my classroom, and so I would have anywhere between 50 and 60 freshmen and sophomore here in the class. And so I don't want to preach to you this morning, but I want to uh, take the subject matter that has been assigned uh, to me today. And we've been talking about um, <clears throat> biblical leadership in a postmodern world. Um, it's important for us to understand what these uh, topics mean. Uh, so when we talk about uh, postmodernism, we need to first of all define what we mean by postmodernism in relationship to modernity. And so what I want to do is to talk about pre-modernism, and then I want to talk about modernism and then I want to talk about postmodernity or postmodernism and how that relates uh, to the church uh, and also let me put up here so that you can see the context uh, since the birth of civilization uh, we have lived in six major periods of time. And the, one of those is certainly the early church, and that goes from uh, AD 30 to AD 100. Okay, that's the first century. Uh, the church is born, Jesus is alive, and then the church is born, and the church uh, establishes what we call apostolic teaching. 
For we would say, Acts 2.42, they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, so apostolic teaching. Then the next period of time that you had is called the patristic period of time. Uh, this period goes from about A.D. 100 up to about uh, A.D., let's say, 800. Uh, and these are the early church fathers. These were men, if you say Paul and Peter and John, then the second class or second tier of leaders would be people like Timothy, Titus, uh, Barnabas, Ephrathoditus. These would be what we call apostolic delegates. They were to continue the teachings of the apostles themselves. But when the apostles died out, of course, you know, it was important for the early letters uh, of the apostles to be circulated among the churches. And so by the time you get to uh, the medieval, well, actually this period here, you have uh, the confessions, you have the creeds, um, you have the rule of faith, and even, if you're following Roman Catholic theology, you even have the rise of the papacy. But all of these were designed to safeguard the faith. Okay? Safeguard the faith. Because uh, we were talking about biblical interpretation. Whenever you talk about looking at a document, uh, you are doing what we call hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the idea of the science of interpretation. All of us, when we come to a text, all of us are engaged in interpreting what that text has to say. Uh, and so when we recognize that people have a variety or a diverse interpretation, then we're going to have, you know, if, if we talk about, you know, denominationalism or we're going to have, I mean, in the early church, it was not so much about denominationalism. It actually had to do with the doctrine of the Trinity. It had to do with the doctrine of Christology. Was Jesus both human and divine? How do we understand that? How is a man 100% human and 100% divine? Uh, when we talk about the Lord's Supper, uh, is it uh, uh, in the, by the time we get to the medieval period, we're talking about the idea of consubstantiation and we're talking about transubstantiation. Consubstanti well, transubstantiation says that when the priest prays over the bread and the wine, that the elements literally become the body and blood of Jesus. Okay? And when Jesus said, this is my body, the early church understood that. So when you read a passage like 1 Corinthians 11, when Paul says some have misappropriated the Lord's Supper, some have gotten sick, some have died, there's something mystical, or the Catholic Church would call it sacramental. Sacramental. It's not just the elements themselves. God is mediating his presence in these emblems. Okay, that's Luther. But consubstantiation, Swingley says, no, the elements do not change. Christ mediates his presence in the Lord's Supper. They don't change, but his presence is made known uh, or even we could say even in the act of baptism. It's not the water, but it's God mediating his presence in the act of obedience. That's called sacramental. Okay, So they were debating the Trinity. Is the Trinity Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Does it deal with three persons? There was a serious debate about, you know, is there three personalities in the uh, the God here, that idea was made known by St. Augustine, which is called the psychological model of the Trinity. All right? Or you get modalism, which says that God shows up 
in three ways as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the idea of denominationalism is not even an issue in the first and second and the third and fourth century. The issue is how do we understand these major doctrines? And what the church is being attacked on today is not around denominationalism. I mean, that's kind of a, a thing between other preachers and other churches, but but, but the issue that the church always was attacked on, even among its critics, is Christology, theology. And I'll even throw this out at you. When you say the Bible is the inspired word of God, what do you mean when you say the inspired word of God? There are eight different definitions of inspiration among those who are conservative evangelical scholars. Eight different definitions. So how do you decide which of the eight is the right one? Some would argue that the Bible is inerrant. The Bible contains no errors. Is there errors in terms of scientific truth, historical truth? Or there's no errors when it comes to theological truth. Are y'all with me? <laughs> Infallibility means that the Bible doesn't make any mistakes in relationship to theological claims. But understand that the biblical writers, when they wrote, they wrote out of their own particular worldview and frame of reference. And we know this when we look at the style of the biblical writers because in each of the books in the Bible, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, we look at what scholars call the literary genre. What type of literature am I reading when I pick up the Bible? I'm looking at prophetic, apocalyptic, parabolic, narrative, law, letters, poetic, what am I looking at? So your methodology about how you see the literary genre determines how you read a text. I would ask people sometimes, when you read the Bible, do you read it from a historical perspective? Do you read it from a theological perspective? Do you read it from a scientific perspective? Do you read it from a literature perspective? I mean, there are multiple ways of reading the Bible. The question is, which one is the right one? Words mean something, but words don't mean something without context. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, for the love of Christ controls us. Now I want to know whether that's objective or subjective genitive. Is it the love that God has for us that keeps me to live right? Or is it my love for him that causes me to do the right thing? The context has to tell you. And even there, there is some ambiguity there. We talk about the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2. Is that the gift that the Holy Spirit gives or is the Holy Spirit the giver himself? So we got to understand when we read the Bible, especially when we don't read the Bible from a... Greek, historic, uh, Greek and Hebrew perspective. So it requires us, and so part of my emphasis when I talk about leadership is the importance of leaders learning to think biblically and theologically, which requires that they have to have some theological training. This school has been around here how long? 86 years. And they've been training preachers and Bible school teachers and one of the reasons that ought to cause you to invest in this school is because theological education is so critical. Everybody around us is engaged in theological education. Now, now, one thing, can I erase this? Is there a way to erase this? I don't want to erase all of it, but, but the point that I want to get, when we talk about who needs theology? 
Whether you know it or not in this, in this room today, you are doing theology. Theology is simply conversation about God. So whether you're in the, in the, in the, in the public uh, schools or you're in the, in the, uh, in the uh, 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 restaurant or you in the uh, stores buying and you have a strike up of conversation with somebody, you are engaged in theological conversation. The question is, what kind of theology are you doing? So there's a book by Grinch and Holson called Who Needs Theology? And one of the things he talks about is that the first one is called folk theology. This is stuff, you know, we, we heard from our parents and our grandparents, a bumper sticker, you know, you know, God said it, I believe it, that sells it. How many of y'all heard that before? Y'all heard that before? Now, think about that statement. Is that statement true? God said it, I believe it, that what? Is that true? Is it true? God said it, I believe it. No, it's not true. And the reason why it's not true is because it is true whether you believe it or not. God doesn't need your affirmation. If he said it, he spoke, and he continues to speak. He didn't need your authorization or approval. So, so folk theology is just common, everyday things that we, we, we've heard, but we never thought about it and reflected on it. And then you have lay theology. That's a person who's, who considers himself or herself to be kind of a student of the Bible, and they use basic commentaries and dictionaries and things like that because they want to do, they want to present their lessons. And then you have ministerial theology. Ministerial theology are guys who've gone to school and uh, got their degrees because their interest is in preparing their sermons, teaching the church, feeding the church. So it's, it's more sermonic driven. And then the fourth one would be what we call professional theology. Guys who can read Greek and Hebrew, guys who can do studious research, things like that, guys who know what's going on in terms of the current issues, not only you know, in, uh, in academia, but what's going on culturally as well. Guys who've gone on and gotten a professional degree, a Master of Divinity degree, or even a doctorate of ministry degree or an EDD, something that deals with the practicality of ministry. And then, okay, I forget this one in here. The last one is what we call academic theologians. PhDs. Okay. So, so there's levels or degrees of training and education. And so I would plug here, it's so important. You know, I, I, you know, I wouldn't send my children to a secular school until I give them at least two years of foundational teaching here at SWCC. Orientate them to a biblical worldview as the term is common used today, but they need an orientation. So when they go to a secular school, I can tell you if they go to a secular school, their faith is going to be challenged because I taught at a secular school. I've taught their intro to ethics, intro to philosophy, and I, I know all of the things that they're going to throw at them philosophically, ethically, and if, you're, if their minds are not prepared, they're not going to be ready. Okay? Now, so it's important that we understand the patristic period. The third period here would be the medieval period. Now, it's important that people like uh, Anselm Aquinas, uh, when we get down to Luther and the Reformation, but that's another period, the Reformation. But, but these people here believed in truth and their beliefs. Their, their, their perspective about there is truth. But their truth is not like what's going to be over here in modernity because modernity is only interested in scientific truth. This is what we call an existential truth. And what do we mean by that? It means truth that deals with my existence. 
Question like, what does it mean to be human? Genesis 1 said, God said, come let us make man in our imago day, in our image, and in our likeness. And if I was to ask you, what is the imago day, the image of God? There's quite a bit of debate on that subject, both in the philosophical arena as well as in the theological arena. Three views of what it means to be human. Man is a substantive creature. He has a soul, and God embedded, embedded within him a soul, a nephesh. So there's something between, that corresponds between me and God. I've got a soul. The life force. Then you have what is called the relational perspective. God is a relational being. God is a social being. God is a community of beings, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're in relationship with one another. And then the other one is called the functional point of view. God gave him dominion over what? The created order. So when man reigns and rules creation. He is a reflection of God in heaven. Man is, God, a God, a man is God's vice regent over the universe. So it's tied to his ability to function as a governor over the created order. Okay? So existential truth. Who am I? Where did I come from? What is the meaning of life? Yes. What is the meaning of life. Because human beings can't live without purpose nor meaning. So we say, what is the telos? What is the goal or the purpose for human existence? Why did God put us here? Everything God does, he does for his glory. And Paul says in Romans 8, verse 29, that the goal is that we might be conformed to his son. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God, what God intended for human beings to be. Man without God is a monstrosity. Man without God is a monster. And Jesus came to show us what it really means to be human. That's why the Bible picks up that idea of the doctrine of the two Adams. The first Adam cast us in ruin and destruction. And the second Adam or the last Adam came to show us what it means to be human and what it means to be free in relationship. God. Okay? So, let me, I saw him do something up here a minute ago uh, to erase that. But now, I just want you to see, in the pre-modern era, truth was this. Wisdom. Now, some of us, we knock the word philosophy. Philosophy. But phileo means to love and sophia means wisdom. And the first book in the Bible, first book in the Bible that's called a philosophical treatise is the book of Ecclesiastes. When Paul is talking about, in Colossians 2, about voiding philosophies, he's not talking about wisdom in the sense that wisdom that is from God, but he's talking about human wisdom that negates or is antithetical to God's will. Christ is the wisdom of God, Paul says. So when we talk about philosophy, we're just simply talking about wisdom. And what is wisdom about? Wisdom is the ability to make choices in your life that you know the outcome of those decisions that you make. Knowledge knows the facts, but wisdom knows how to make those decisions. So the wisdom literature is very key. But even in the Old Testament, the ancient wisdom of the, of the, uh, of the sages is a partial revelation. It's incomplete. You don't get full revelation until you get where? To the New Testament. Right? 
So you can't build a theology on an Old Testament saying. You got to see that saying in relationship to what theologians like to refer to as Christocentric. What does that mean? That Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. You can't even talk about creation until you talk about Jesus. In the beginning was what? The Word. And the Word was what? With God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were what? Made by him. Paul says through him and for him. So if you're reading at at, at the, the creation narrative without talking about Jesus, you missed it. Now, let me do, let me do this, do the best I can. So that's the pre-modern era. The pre-modern era is about wisdom. Socrates said the unexamined life is not worth living. You build your life on a set of assumptions and presuppositions, and you never take the time to examine the foundations of your life. Then he says, when the storms of life come, guess what happens? Your life will what? Collapse. Because you build on the wrong foundation. So when we talk about uh, the unexamined, the unexamined life is not worth living. Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he shall what? Gain the whole world and what? And he tells that parable about a man who builds his house on a rock or he builds his house on the sand. The storms of life will come and you will collapse. Okay. So the unexampled. So the, so the pre-modern people were concerned about how to live. So some would argue that they were concerned more about ethics. How to make good moral choices. Now Aristotle and Plato believed that uh, uh, that there, there were four cardinal virtues that every man should have. He should have wisdom. He should have courage. He should have justice. And he should have prudence. Wisdom to make good choices. Courage is to have the courage to live and make those choices in spite of what others may think about you. Justice, give every man his rightful due. And prudence is learning to navigate through the landmines of life. Are y'all with me? Okay, all right. But Aquinas says, no, you, you don't just need those four. You need what we call the theological virtues. Ah, uh, faith, hope, and love. What's the object of faith? It's God. Matter of fact, the object of faith is not even the Bible. The Bible points us to the God that's revealed yes, in the Bible. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Hebrews 11, 6, without faith it is impossible to please God, but he that cometh to God must believe that God what? God is. The object of faith is God. And then you can talk about faith as a noun or you can say that faith is the verb. I put my trust in him, trust in him. What a noun would refer to theological teachings and doctrine, but the verb, I put my faith in my confidence, my trust in God. So they came up with uh, what we call the seven virtues that every person ought to have, at least in Roman Catholic theology. But faith in God, hope in God, love of God. Why? Because God is what? He's love. You don't know how to love until you understand what God means by the word love. Don't project on God what humans define as love. So again, they're interested in wisdom, making the right ethical choices. In modernity, modernity is interested in what they call scientific truth. 
coming on the hills of the Renaissance, the idea was, let's go back to the sources. And the sources for them in Western culture was Greek and Hebrew and Latin. Let's go back to the sources. Because remember, by the time we get to the 15th century and Martin, Martin Luther, the Bible is no longer in the language of Greek and Hebrew. It's in Latin. And it's locked up in the Catholic Church. That's not till you get to Luther or even... Uh, um, trying to think of the guy who actually took the Bible and translated it into English, but Luther translated into German, and he got in trouble. Because here's what the Catholic Church said. If we allow the Bible in the common language of the people, you'll have so many denominations and splintering because all of us claim our interpretation is the right interpretation. They said, man, we keep it, let's keep it in Latin, okay, so that uh, we won't have this mess on our hands. And so when Luther and others translated the Bible into the common language, 1611, shortly after, you know, Luther lived in the 1500s, shortly after that you get the King James Version of the Bible. And guess what? You have a proliferation of various denominations because now the Bible is translated in the common language of the people. But in the modernity period, they're interested in scientific truth. And what the argument is, is that the two kinds of truth in the modern period was what we call a priori and a posteriori, which is a priori deals with reason and a posteriori deals with experience. And if theological truth cannot fit in the categories of a priori, reason, or experience, it's not true. So how do you take the virgin birth and the resurrection of Jesus and place them in scientific categories? All of my theological training I was trained in the German method of biblical interpretation called the historical critical method. Can you reduce theological truths even into history? The Germans came up with an interesting term they call history, which is dealing with public information that is acts, has access to the public domain. We can research it, we can look at it, we can, we can study it. The virgin birth and the resurrection of Jesus, even the dual nature of Jesus is not a historical claim. Not what the biblical writers are trying to do. It's a dialectical truth, human and divine. It's a mystery. But in the modern world, we are so concerned about absolute certainty rather than mystery. Can you guys live with mystery? You can't explain the Trinity. Why are you trying to explain the Trinity? Augustine said, if you try to explain the Trinity, you will blow your mind. <laughs> and if you deny the Trinity, you'll lose your soul. <laughs> the cardinal theological truth we have is the Trinitarian notion that God revealed himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you must accept it by faith. The virgin birth. Luke was a physician. And Luke knew that uh, babies are not born by immaculate conception. There had to be a human seed and a human egg. If 
It's a mystery. See, I, see, the problem with the modern world, the modern world has put us in the framework that we have to explain what we believe in rational terms. That's a wrong move. Remember that God has revealed himself. Notice the word revelation. God has self-disclosed himself in Jesus Christ. So scholars would use the term geschichte. Geschichte is sacred truth or sacred history. It doesn't mean that Jesus didn't exist, <clears throat> but to understand his dual nature is an article of faith. Because there were people even in Jesus' day didn't believe that Jesus was God manifest in flesh. Right. Pharisees say, man, you're not even 50 years old. You're talking about you God. <laughs> Call it theological history. And listen, listen. I'll say this, but you, you may not like it. You need no apologetics to defend revelation. The Bible will defend itself. God needs no defending. And then what proof are you going to use to defend God? Aquinas' argument, the cosmological, teleological, moral argument, all that. You know, now that deals with this word here. This is, a, this is an abstraction. Because you could take this word God and fill in any other God like Islam, Judaism. Because at least we know in Judaism, Brother Foster, at least the implication is in Genesis 1 and other passages, come let us make man. And at least we can suggest that there's possibly what? Two. We don't know whether it's three until we get where? To the New Testament. So the idea of the Trinity is a Christian idea, even though you don't never find a term in the New Testament. But the concept is there. So don't give up the Trinitarian idea. That's the heart of the New Testament. Okay? But that word God is an abstraction because I need to stop and say, when you talk about God, what God are you talking about? Plato's God, the unmoved mover. What do you mean when you use the word God? And then if you use terms like God is omnipotent and God is omnipresent and God is omniscient. Now those terms are never found in the Bible. Those are Greek concepts that the second and third century used to explain to the culture of their day who spoke Greek to help them conceptualize the God of the Bible. But don't conflate the God of the Greeks with the God of the Bible. The God of the Greeks is static. He's unmovable. The God of the Greeks is impassable. God is impassable. What does impassibility mean? God cannot experience any psychological states of emotions. And I see God all the way through the Bible get angry, God says he loves, right? God sits down and makes covenants with people. You never see that in Greek philosophy. You go back and look at Zeus and Poseidon and Apollo and all. Matter of fact, some people say that they are projections of human beings who want to be God. What about this word here, immutability? God don't change. That's what y'all say, God don't change. Well, I want to understand... How does God become a human being if he doesn't change? Philippians 2, he gave up his glory. We call it the kenosis theory. I want to know what God you talking about. Because the God of the Old and New Testament is engaging. He's dynamic. He's loving. The center of his life is loving. And he invites all of us to share in the Trinitarian life. 
And then, so this is, so when you talk about the modernity, I'm so glad post-modernity came along that we got out of the modern world. Because the modern world in the 1914s, after World War I, people moved away from modernity because modernity made the claim that it has scientific truth. And because it has scientific truth, every problem that human beings have can now be resolved because education. And the First World War, and then World War II with the atomic bomb, we discovered that our education can kill us. <laughs> The pre-modern world, as Jeff said, it does argue about the negation of absolute truth. There is no objective, universal, absolute truth. It believes in diversity and it believes in tolerance. But it also makes the claim that scientific truth is not the only truth there is. Pascal, one of the great philosophers, said that the heart has reasons that the mind does not understand. If I ask Jeff to explain to me, you've been married 40, how many years? 40 years. And I said to him, explain to me scientifically why you love your wife. I notice I said scientifically. He can only explain to me his love for his wife as an existential truth. It's a subjective truth. Soren Kierkegaard said, truth is not objective, truth is subjective. And what he meant by that, that it's not that there's not objective truth. What he's saying is truth remains abstract until you personalize it in your own life. John chapter 8, Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Some of us, we know the truth. I know the truth when it comes to, you know, weight management and all that, where I can get like Dr. Seems so slim and healthy and all that. I know, I know all that information. The problem is when you go to the restaurant, you got to learn to have discipline to make the right choices, right? When I learn to make the right choices, now I embrace the truth. But, but until it becomes a reality in my own life, now it's truth, but it's not truth in me. And then watch this, John 14, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. He's not talking about some abstract truth. John chapter 18, Pilate said, what is true? He said, man, don't you know the truth is standing right in front of you? <laughs> so if you get caught up in the scientific definition of what is true, you'll miss theological truth. And postmodernity says, you know, that uh, all of us have our own stories, our narratives. You have a story, I have a story. Now what we have to do is sit down and dialogue with one another concerning your truth. And my question is not whether it's scientific truth, I wanna know is it theological truth. And let me say this last of all. Leaders today in the church I believe that our leaders, now we, here, here, don't get me wrong, we know good Church of Christ doctrine, but I'm convinced we don't know the Bible. And don't assume, don't assume that you know the Bible, as a matter of fact, the, lot, the study of the Bible is a lifelong pursuit. There's stuff that I have taught and I had to go back and reteach it because 
I thought I had the truth. And remember, remember this. All of us are on a journey. We call it a theological journey. And what you saw as truth when you were 18, 19, 20 years of age, by the time you get 40, you say, oh, man, that's not the truth. Or I see truth from a different angle or a different perspective because I got a little bit of wisdom on me and I see things in a different way. All of us in the state of process, in the state of becoming. Anybody tell you that they have arrived when it comes to the Bible? Get away from them as fast as you can. <laughs> because this is the last thing I'll say. To study the Bible, you have to be concerned about history, language, culture, worldview, literature. All of these things are involved. Oh, I didn't even put the most important one up there, theological. So when you read a text, ask yourself, what's the theological truth that God wants me to get out of this verse? Don't think that just because you're given the historical background and information that you've actually given people the Bible. Okay? All right, I think I'm done. Um, huh? <laughs> Uh, also, can I make a plug? Uh, I've written two books, one called Engaging the Culture. Uh, a lot of that I talk about in the book, and then I wrote another book called God, uh, Essays on Ethics and Morality, and I even raised the quintessential question about God and black suffering. How did God allow us to experience what we experience? Now, I didn't bring any copies with me today, but if you're interested, let me get your contact information. I'll send you a a flyer or email let you know. Thank you, Dr. Gilmore. Let's give him a round of applause. Outstanding job. Let's also give Dr. Carruthers a round of applause. An amazing presentation of God's word. And guess what? We're not through with these two great scholars. Uh, we're going to we're gonna make a couple of announcements. We're going to have a couple of songs. We're going to hear our uh, afternoon speaker. Uh, and uh, Brother David Watkins, and then we're going to come back and we'll be able to ask questions, engage them, uh, probe around some of their uh, theological pers perspectives. And so we're excited about that. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Foster and then over to Dwayne Pugh. Thank you, Dr. Simpson. I just want to uh, commend these two speakers, You've done a great job. And we're so pleased with their messages. And, but overall, I wanted to uh, give some kudos to Dr. Seamster as he's put this lectureship together. And if you really recognize how he's bringing the old and the young and, and really relating to everything that's going on. And I just can't wait till we get to this afternoon, uh, uh, tomorrow afternoon, and we're going to be dealing with restoration. And that's going to really be great as well. So we're having a great time, and we want to give some uh, kudos, as I said, to our president, because this is a job well done. Let's give man. <laughs> We prepare our hearts to hear Brother Watkins. We're gonna lift a, lift a song after which we will have none other than Brother David Watkins come bless our hearts with the word. There's a happy land of promise over in the great beyond where the saved of earth shall soon the glory share. Where the souls of men shall enter and live on forevermore. Everybody will be happy over there. Oh, and everybody, we will be happy. Oh, we'll be happy over there. And we will shout and sing God's 
praises everybody will be happy over there well there the ransom of all ages will be singing round the throne in that land where no one ever knows a care and the christians of all nations will join in triumph song everybody will be happy over oh and everybody say every everybody will be oh will be happy oh over there and we will shout and sing his praises to be in the house of God uh, on this morning to uh, share in my religious convictions, um, I recognize and realize that I am here as a product of grace, and I'm thankful for that. Um, I want to acknowledge the president of this great institution, Dr. Seamster, uh, for the opportunity to uh, share uh, in this gathering on this year. And we certainly appreciate all of the efforts that you have done, you and your staff and your team have done to uh, keep Southwestern open. Uh, and we celebrate you and honor you for uh, that work that you have done. We appreciate all of you who have gathered this morning uh, in learning, collective learning together. Uh, we also appreciate uh, Dr. Carruthers uh, and uh, Dr. Um, uh, Gilmore, Gilmore for uh, wonderful presentations on today. And it is my sincere prayer that Southwestern continues to be a place where um, academia and diverging opinions uh, could live. Amen. Uh, and so we appreciate uh, the scholarship of both of those men. Amen. Also, I appreciate being here with my mentor, uh, Dr. Blakeney, uh, who did a phenomenal job of preaching the word of God on last night. And I always want to acknowledge and honor him uh, whenever I stand. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 43. I was not given a text, and so I, I chose my own. Um, and so Isaiah 43 in verse number 18 and 19, the Bible says, Do not call to mind the former things or ponder things of the past. Behold. I will do something new, and now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? I will even make a roadway in the wilderness, rivers 
in the desert. I don't want to preach as the Spirit of the Lord shall guide with this thought in mind. God does not live in the past. God does not live in the past. Father, I thank you because you do not treat me as my sins deserve. But I thank you for grace and I thank you for mercy. And now I be beseech thee for preaching power that everyone who will hear the word will receive relevancy and be changed by it. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. amen. The proclamation of the book of Isaiah is one of the longest books uh, in the Old Testament. Yeah. Isaiah prophesied during a time of history that was generally peaceful and prosperous. This causes the book of Isaiah to be viewed through a unique interpretive lens in that Isaiah did not just preach about his current cultural environment, but he also prophesied about future events. Chapters 1 through 39 deals primarily with the events that occurred during Isaiah's lifetime. But chapters 40 begins the, uh, the prophecy of Judah's return from Babylonian captivity. Said another way, Isaiah prophesied for nearly 40 years from about 740 B.C. to 700 B.C. The Babylonian exile of Judah started at about 598 B.C., which means that chapters 40 through 66 of the book is all about what God would do in regard to Babylon and Judah. Concerning our text, some people would improperly and inaccurately survey that Isaiah's statements are in response to God already delivering Israel. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, Isaiah's words are nearly a hundred years prior to the capture of Judah. And let's not forget that Judah was in Babylon captivity for nearly 70 years which means that Isaiah is prophesying about events that are between 100 to 170 years beyond his time. Isaiah is in an interesting predicament. He is charged by God to preach and to prophesy to people about a departure from God and a punishment by God that they've not even yet experienced. He, he is talking to their current self about their future situation and they don't even have the capacity to understand the gravity of the situation. It is in this discourse that Isaiah introduces Babylon as a captor who has conquered the world. But he also introduces uh, to them, himself to them, as one who is able to pluck Judah from the hands of Babylon. God encourages them by reminding them of their history. In other words, God is saying to them, if I did it once, I can do it again. In Isaiah chapter 42, in verse number 6, God asserts his identity to him, uh, to them when he says, I am the Lord and I have called you into righteousness and I will hold you by the hand and watch over you and I'll appoint you as a covenant to the people. It's easy to forget that this is a prophecy. This prophecy is the equivalent of me telling my six-year-old son about all the mistakes that he will make. 
and all of the consequences that he will suffer, but how I still love him and that I will always accept him back in as my child. My, my six-year-old son does not have the capacity to understand what lies ahead of him, but because I'm his daddy, I know what lies ahead. So in our prophesied text of Isaiah chapter 43, Isaiah is prophesying to Judah about how God will redeem them. He, he says to them in verses 1 and 2, three things. He says, I formed you, I redeemed you, and I called you by name. The, these three things are to be understood as a gradual escalation in the redemption process. God creates first, he shapes secondly, and then he summons us. God is telling Judah that you will mess up. You will suffer the consequences. You will need deliverance. Uh, but don't think that just because you messed up that I'll leave you there. I created you. Uh, your value is not tied to what you're tied up in. I redeemed you. I called you by name. You belong to me. Wait a minute, God. What about what I look like? What about what I've been through? What about what my current situation and God said, you are mine, and I called you. Then, then God uses hyper, hyperbolic language to express a degree of care and concern that he has for his people. The, the text says in verse number two, when you pass through waters, I will be with you. And through the river, rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor the flame will burn, burn you. And then again in verse number eight, Isaiah calls on the people to be a witness to God's ability to deliver. He says, bring out the people who are blind even though they have eyes and the deaf even though they have ears. Uh, this is a challenge to the other nations and their gods because I know it because the Bible says in verse number nine, let them bring uh, and present their witnesses that they may be justified and let them hear and say it is true. In other words, God is saying, ain't nobody like me. Can't nobody do what I can do. Can't no other God bring out their witnesses and testify that I have given sight to the blind and I've made the deaf hear. Is there anybody in here that knows ain't nobody like the Lord? You can search all over and look high and low, but the witness is today ain't nobody like the let me let me calm down. God, God is establishing a case with Israel that God alone is to be trusted. God alone is to be worshiped. God has a track record of delivering them. They have no reason to doubt that they will be delivered out of the hand of Babylon. God then reminds them of their former deliverance in verse number 16. He says, thus saith the Lord yes, who made a way through the Red Sea and a path through the mighty water yeah. who brings forth the chariot and the horse, the army and the mighty men. They will lie down together and not rise up and they have been quenched and extinguished like a witch. Wick, uh, th th that is a reminder of what God had done for them. God is essentially saying, I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you through the Red Sea. I drowned Pharaoh in his army. The only reason why you're here today is because I delivered you. But what's perplexing, Dr. Foster, is what he says next. Uh, verse number 18, he says, but don't call to mind the former things or ponder on the things of the past. And this messed me up uh, because God just spent 18 verses reminding them of all that he had done. God reminded them that I 
gave you sight. I gave you hearing. I brought you out of Egypt. I drowned Pharaoh. I drowned his army. But I'm telling you now, forget the former things. And it messed me up because why does God spend all this time telling them and reminding them of what he did for them only to tell them to forget it? What does it mean to forget the past if I need to pass to trust God for the future? Notice in the text that Isaiah does not tell, God, uh, uh, tell them to forget God. He tells them to forget the past. Uh, this is not a prohibition against remembering. This is a prohibition against idolizing the deliverance and ignoring the deliverer. Can, can I preach how I feel it in here? The, the Jews had a, a history of taking God's method of deliverance and idolizing the tool but forgetting and rejecting the teacher. Do you remember the bronze snake on the pole found in Numbers chapter 21 that Moses had built for them when the people were bitten by poisonous snakes? Uh, the snake disappears in scripture but reappears in 2 Kings chapter number 8 in verse number 4 as an idol that they worship. There was no power in the bronze snake. The power was in the God who told them to build the snake. But yet they took the bronze snake and made it an idol. That's because the people of God have a habit of idolizing the method of deliverance while not respecting the deliverer. So in Isaiah chapter 43, the direction to not call to mind or to remember the former things is about making sure you don't expect God to deliver in the same way he delivered you the last time. Can I preach it how I feel it in here? God is saying, I cannot be handicapped by your imagination. I can't be relegated to your memory. I can't be reserved to your reservations. Just because I did it like that the last time don't mean I'm going to do it like this the next time. Uh, in verse number 19, he says, Behold, I'm going to do something new. The word new here means fresh. It, it means uh, that God does something new. He, he's going to do something fresh. And here's what he's trying to say. I'm the same God who did it the last time. And if I did it the last time, uh, then I can do something new the next time. Uh, I don't have to bring you through Egypt or out of Egypt anymore. I can do something new. I, I don't have to drown Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea. I can do something new. I, I don't have to do what I did last year. I can do something new. And is there anybody in this place that can say, thank you, Lord, because you can do something new. Is there anybody that's looking for God to show up in a new way in your life? He doesn't have to do it like he did it. He can do something new. He... Okay, okay. Uh, what, what, I, what I learned about the text is that God is not relegated to the circumstances or to merely new circumstances. God uh, this new idea or this new thing that God will do is not only the circumstances of the deliverance, but it's also the consequences of the deliverance. Uh, it's not only what he does that's new. It is what he does and what that produces that's new. I ain't making it up. It's right there in the text because the Bible says, Behold, I'll do something new and it shall spring forth. Um, the, the English rendering of this kind of is misleading. It, uh, it, it is not that it will future tense spring forth, 
What he's saying is uh, that it is springing forth. Let, let, let me help you. I, Isaiah is saying that the new thing is already springing forth. Now, now this messed me up because remember, this prophecy is at least a hundred years before Babylon. So God, how are you springing something new up and the problem ain't even happened yet? How are you working out deliverance and uh, Babylon ain't even in captivity yet? How are you making it new for me? And, and, and they don't even know that there is a slavery and a captivity. Yet, a hundred years at least before captivity, you said you'll do something new. And what I like about God is that God will work out your deliverance before you even know that there's a bondage. God will create a solution to the problem before you even know that there's a problem. God has figured out that there will be a problem and he worked out your escape to the problem before you knew there was a problem. I, I thought I was preaching the Church of Christ folk in here. Is there anybody that can thank God this morning that before your name was what it was, uh, that God already knew that David Watkins would be born in a little town called Perry, Florida, and he would grow up to mess up, but he sent a savior uh, all the way since the beginning of time to make sure that I would have deliverance from a problem. Okay, okay, okay. Um, you ought to stop and give God glory right now because he's working it out. I Isaiah asked a question meant to cause reflection and awareness. He says, will you not be aware of it? In other words, are you aware of how God is working and how God will work? The question is not about uh, whether they will uh, be aware or they are aware of how God has worked or used to work. The question is it about whether or not you are aware and will be aware of how he is working. The question about what is about whether they have enough faith in the truth that God doesn't have to come in the same way he came before. <laughs> God can deliver you differently next time than he did the last time. And I, I told the church this Sunday, I'm at this place in my life where I am paying attention to how God is moving now. God, uh, y'all ain't talking back to me. How he moved last year only gives me enough faith to know that it can move. But I'm paying attention to how God is moving in my life right now. I, I'm paying attention to what God is moving and how he's moving in my marriage. I'm, I'm paying attention to how God is moving in my body and in my health. I'm paying attention to how God is moving in my faith. I'm grateful, God, that you brought me through the Red Sea last year. But what are you going to do for me this year, God? How are you going to deliver me right now? What are you doing in my life right now? God, I'm paying attention. So, I need you to know that God uh, can do a new thing. First time, he saved your job. Second time, he'll give you a new job. First time, he healed your body. Second time, he'll give you a new body. First time, he comforted you 
when you cried the second time he can stop the pain altogether the first time he let you walk away from the car accident the second time he'll make the car miss you altogether God can do a new thing well, I'm getting ready to sit down somewhere. Y'all look like y'all hungry, but let me just tell you, as speaking of a new thing, when it comes back, he'll come back doing a new thing. First time it came, he walked the dusty roads of Damascus. But the second time he comes, uh, he'll meet believers in the air. The first time he came uh, as a crying baby being delivered to his mama at a stable. But the second time he came, the Bible says he'll be visible by all. The first time he came, the multitudes scream crucify, crucify. The second time he comes, the Bible says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. God will do a new thing. I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I maybe may I just give a word uh, of caution to the church that we ought to be looking for God to show up in a new way. We, we ought to be looking at how God intends to work in this culture. We ought to be looking at what God is going to do to manifest himself before mankind. God will do. A new thing. I'm I'm done with y'all today. I, I I I don't know about y'all, but I'm just looking for God to do a new thing. And and I've gotten to the place, uh, and, and I don't know whether you think I'm old enough or not, but I don't care. But I've gotten to a place where I have had enough experiences with God to know that God is able to defy the doctor's orders. God is able to defy all scientific reasoning. God is able to defy all of our theology. God is able to create a rule and then break Break his own rule. God is God. God is God. God is doing a new thing. God bless y'all so much. Appreciate you so much. Amen. We're going to turn it over to Brother Pew in just a second. Let's give God one more hand clap of praise. Amen. I don't care what they say about David. He can preach. David can preach. He can preach. We just need to just let him preach and then just uh, lock him up somewhere. And then don't let him out until it's time to preach again. But he, he's an amazing preacher with a lot of energy, a lot of passion. And he preaches in such a way uh, that a blind man can see it, a fool can understand it, but God gets all of the praise and all of the glory. We just want to make one quick announcement before Brother Pugh comes, and that is that we are going to come back at 1.15, 1.30 today after you uh, enjoy a delicious lunch. And we're going to take the two presenters to two lectures, Dr. Carruthers and Dr. Gilmore. We're going to appropriate their talks and we're going to apply them to leadership amen so we're going to appropriate that literary analysis and then that that theological analysis uh to leadership uh this afternoon so come with your questions make sure that you enjoy your lunch we love you david we love you uh dr gilmore we love you dr carruthers and we look forward to having all of you back now I turn the program back over to the very capable hands of brother Dwayne Pugh. All right, we're going to prepare to dismiss, uh, but we want to remind everyone that we have vendors that are here in this building. Uh, as you go out of these doors to the back, you can head straight um, to the other. Uh, there are some in this hallway as well as in the room that's on the other side of the chapel. And so we encourage you to please um, put peek your head in the door and support our vendors that are here. 
Uh, in addition to the vendors, uh, the bookstore, the Southwestern Christian College bookstore, will be open as well. Uh, that can be accessed. It's at the lower level of the sub of the student union building. Uh, and there, uh, there are, you can access it uh, both via the stairs and there's uh, also a ramp that goes straight to the, the bookstore. So we encourage you to, uh, to go there as well, pick up some Southwestern paraphernalia and what have you. Uh, so they're doing a great job down there. And so we encourage you to stop by and see our vendors and to see uh, the bookstore as well. Let's bow and let's go to God in a word of prayer as we prepare to dismiss. God, our Father, we thank you again, God, for what our eyes and ears have been able to witness on this morning. We thank you, O oh God, for Dr. Carruthers. We thank you for Dr. Gilmore. And we thank you for Brother Watkins, God. We ask that you would just bless them in a very special and particular way. We thank you, O oh God, for what they what was on their hearts to share with us and, uh, and the manner in which they shared it, Father. Help us to receive those things. Take them in and process them, God, so that we might become better uh, for you, better for one another. Father, we ask that you would just continue to guide us and bless us until we are able to gather in, in this place again. We love you. We thank you and we honor you. We thank you for Southwestern, oh God. We thank you for each and every person that's involved in uh, continuing to move this institution forward. And God, we ask that you would continue to keep your hand upon her. We love you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.